Hi, engineers. So in this video, we're going to talk about the treatment of COVID-19, which is caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Then after that, we'll get into some detail about the prognosis, things that are actually going to make very significant effects on the overall prognosis of someone who is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which leads to the COVID-19 infection. And lastly, we'll talk about the precautions that you should take into consideration to, again, prevent the further transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, again, responsible for the COVID-19 infection. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so first thing that we should know when we're talking about COVID-19 caused by the SARS coronavirus type 2 is we should really, really understand that whenever somebody thinks that they're having symptoms of it, right, fever, cough, shortness of breath, maybe they're tachycardic, maybe they're, maybe they're tachypnic, first thing you should try to do is self-quarantine, okay? When you self-quarantine for at least 14 days, during that time period, just monitor your symptoms. Is my fever getting any worse? Is it staying the same? Is it not breaking? Is it still greater than or equal to 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit? Is my cough getting worse? Is it becoming more productive? Am I having a significant time breathing? Is my shortness of breath getting worse? Am I becoming dehydrated because of my fever? Am I not producing enough urine? Monitor all these things during that 14 day period. And if you start seeing yourself not improving or you start kind of going backwards and getting worse, that would be the time to call your healthcare provider, call your family doctor, set up a telemedicine visit. The reason why you want to do that is so that you don't go and potentially introduce that virus to other people. So that's one thing you should do. Also, if you are going to go to an ER, make sure that whenever they triage you, they're doing it by actually either doing it through phone call or they're coming out in their PPE and basically triaging you, getting a good history and checking your vitals, seeing if it's necessary for you to be quarantined in the hospital and monitored. Okay. After you've done that, you've notified the CDC of the case that they test positive. The next thing that you're going to start doing is treating the patient pretty much supportively. We don't have tons of information about this virus, but what we do know is that the SARS-CoV-2 can lead to COVID-19, which can lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome. Well, so what are the things that we're going to do? Well, if someone's having a fever, right, they could potentially lead to dehydration, but you have to be careful. Okay. Because if someone's having ARDS, they're going to be fluid overloading a lot of that lung tissue. So you don't want to give them too much fluid and then cause them to have more pulmonary edema or interstitial edema, potentially worsening the situation. So if you're going to give fluids, you want to make sure that you give those fluids sparingly. So we can give IV fluids, right? And again, this can be in the form of lactated ringers. This can be in the form of normal saline, but you just have to be careful. You don't want to fluid resuscitate them too much because you can water overload that lung. Okay. So we want to give fluids sparingly. Okay. So that's one big thing. Okay. Next thing is we want to try to be able to reduce the fever. How can we reduce the fever? It's really simple. Give antipyretics, right? So you can give Tylenol. Tylenol is going to be one thing that you can do to help to act as an antipyretic. So Tylenol, okay, and that's going to help to decrease the fever. What are some other things that you can do for these patients? Okay, there has been some research on a bunch of different drugs that they're seeing being used, particularly when patients are at comfort measures only. So they're pretty much really going downhill. Their ARDS has really led to systemic inflammatory response syndrome, potentially septic shock. They are in severe cases and they're just going downhill. In those situations, they've given particular drugs which have, have been able to uh, help the patient in this recovery, sometimes even turning the patient around and helping them to return back to their normal baseline. What are some of these drugs? Again, they're not easily accessed. They're not something that you can go and get. They are medications that are, are being researched, and some of them, particularly the specific one, remdesivir, is in stage three clinical trials right now. So some of these medications we're going to talk about that are, are effective, okay, and we're going to talk about the mechanism of action, can be used potentially to treat COVID-19. So what are some of these drugs? One is called remdesivir. Okay, this one actually might sound familiar because remdesivir was actually used to treat Ebola virus. Okay, how does remdesivir work? It's actually really interesting. If you guys remember from when we talked about in the video in COVID-19 where we went over the pathogenesis, if we're going to briefly recap that, right? So again, you have that ACE2 receptor which binds to the S-spike. Okay, so the S spike on the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus. 
right? When it binds, it then gets taken into the cell and brought into a endosome, right? From there, it's gonna release the single-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm. From here, that single-stranded RNA, that positive sense RNA, right? Positive sense single-stranded RNA is then going to get translated by the host cell's ribosomes. Now, once it gets translated, what, does, what happens with that? So we're gonna lead to translation. What is translation? It's we're taking the RNA and making proteins. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna make a bunch of polyproteins, which we're just gonna highlight here with specific colors here. We'll draw here's a green polyprotein, here's a black polyprotein. We'll do a black polyprotein, right? And then we also have a pink polyprotein. And we'll just do one more for the heck of it here. We'll have a little blue one. Okay. Now, from here, these polyproteins, what happens to them? Well, remember, there's a specific enzyme, right? Called proteinases, which are basically proteases. What they do is they break down these polyproteins into the different units that are gonna be making up the capsomeres, making up the nucleocapsid, making up the spike proteins, certain enzymes that are important for the virus. So again, what are these enzymes here called? They're called protein aces, okay? They're basically Prote uh, proteasomes, right? So they're basically gonna be breaking down these polyproteins into smaller proteins. Then from here, we have all these different proteins which are components of the virus. What do we do here? There's another enzyme. You guys remember this little cute enzyme? This enzyme is called RNA dependent RNA polymerase, right? And what does this guy do? He takes this positive sense single-stranded RNA and actually polymerizes it into making more RNA. So now I'm gonna take single-stranded RNA, convert it into more single-stranded RNA, positive sense, and then guess what I have now? I have all the components I need to make my virus. Now what I can do is I take my positive sense, single-stranded RNA, combine it with the nucleocapsid, the enzymes, all my spike proteins, and then go ahead and release this virus, rupturing the cell, and popping out little baby viruses that can go and infect other nearby cells. So now, now that we know this mechanism, right? Remdesivir, guess what he does? He inhibits this enzyme. So if remdesivir is actually going to be inhibiting this enzyme, remdesivir, it's going to inhibit this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Can you make more single-stranded RNA, which is gonna be a component to making more viruses? No. So that's one thing. All right, so the next thing is, what if we can block the entry of the virus into this endosome? Well, we can. There actually is another drug, an anti-malarial drug called chloroquine. And this guy can inhibit the entry of this virus into the endosome. If you can't get the virus in here, it's not going to be able to release its SSRNA to be able to make proteins and to make new SSRNA. We can't make any new viruses, right? And we can couple that with another enzyme called, I mean, another drug called ritonavir. And ritonavir is a protease inhibitor. Where were the proteases at? The proteinases. So if I combine chloroquine inhibiting the viral entry into the endosome, and I use it with another drug called ritonavir, which is a protease inhibitor, I'm going to inhibit the conversion of these polyproteins into the actual components that are needed for the virus, like the nucleocapsid, the spike proteins, and enzymes. I can't make that, I can't make the virus. Okay, what else could we use? Another drug that has also been seen in this, besides remdesivir, chloroquine, and ritonavir, is another drug called tocilizumab. Okay, tocilizumab, this is actually one of the DMARDs, the biologic DMARDs. This is really cool, all right? Now, Remember we said that if this cell, whenever the viruses are released out, they're gonna destroy this cell. And this is happening to a lot of our type two alveolar cells, right? This is a type two pneumocyte that we're zooming in on right now because they have that ACE2 receptor which allows for the virus to infect them. When they're destroyed, they release specific inflammatory mediators. And those inflammatory mediators then stimulate the macrophages, the alveolar macrophages. 
when the alveolar macrophages are stimulated by tissue damage, they start releasing specific cytokines. Which one of the big ones? They release interleukin-6. If you guys remember, they did also can release interleukin-1, and they can release tumor necrotic factor alpha. But one of the big ones is interleukin-6. Interleukin-6, if you guys remember, interleukin-1, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, what did they do? They stimulate the capillary endothelium to become really leaky, which allows for a lot of fluid to leak out into the tissue spaces, causing interstitial edema, alveolar edema, right? It also can promote vasodilation to increase the blood flow through here, but that's going to allow for more fluid to extravasate out into those little tissue spaces. What else could it also do? If you guys remember, it also attracted in neutrophils. And if we get a lot of neutrophils that come into this area, remember what they release? Reactive oxygen species, they release proteases, and what does that do to the actual uh, type 1 and type 2 alveolar cells? It destroys them. It destroys the capillary interface as well. If you damage that respiratory membrane, what's going to happen now? You're going to alter gas exchange, right? So if we can actually give a drug particularly to block interleukin-6, like tocilizumab, then we might be able to decrease a lot of that inflammatory response. Another thing you could also do to just generally decrease inflammation, and again, this is you got to be careful with this one, but you could do corticosteroids. They're significant at being able to reduce inflammation by inhibiting like the phospholipase A2, which is a part of that whole arachidonic acid pathway, right? Which leads to excessive amounts of leukotrienes and even some prostaglandin production, okay? So a vaccine would be beautiful, but unfortunately they're saying that this vaccine might not be available, well, pretty much won't be available potentially until 2021. So we don't plan on having a vaccine within this 2020 year. It's probably not gonna be till 2021, which again can allow for us to have some type of immunity against this virus in the future. Well, these patients, remember, what do we say? They have severe acute respiratory distress syndrome potentially. Potentially it could actually lead to pneumonia. The pneumonia can be very severe, which can lead to ARDS. ARDS can lead to SIRS. SIRS can lead to septic shock, and septic shock can then progress to multi-system organ failure. So we gotta make sure that we are properly ventilating these lungs. Because remember, what happens in ARDS? You guys remember that if what happens in ARDS is that the alveoli collapse because of the decreased surface tension, because of all the interstitial edema, because of the hyaline membranes that are forming, all of that stuff is impairing gas exchange. And if you impair gas exchange, that decreases the oxygen diffusion across this capillary interface. If you decrease the oxygen diffusion across this, you decrease the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, and that can lead to hypoxemia. We have to try to help this. So we need to ventilate the patients, okay? So the preferred thing to do here is mechanical ventilation. So basically, we want to help them breathe. There is many different types of mechanical ventilation. This is not to be meant to be a very comprehensive lecture of it. What I want you to understand is, is we prefer in these patients, because they can aerosolize the virus, we should not do high flow nasal cannula. That could potentially aerosolize the virus. We do not want to do a lot of the NIPPVs, which is the non-invasive positive pressure ventilations because those can also aerosolize the virus. Unless there's a way that you can cover it like with a helmet mask interface. Either way, we don't wanna do these. Unfortunately, we need to intubate the patient and control their breathing for them. So some of the things that you might have actually heard about with respect to ARDS is there's a couple different ways that you can do this. One is you can try to help them breathe through what's called the AC volume control method, okay? This is not the best method, but it is a type of like lung protective method, but you gotta constantly change the settings. The quick and dirty point of this is, is whenever you're having a patient with ARDS, what you wanna do is you wanna try to ventilate them, right? But if you push too much air into their lungs, okay, that air is not gonna be going into the damaged lung. It's gonna be going into healthy lung tissue. Let me explain to you what I mean. Let's imagine here, I have an airway. Here's gonna be the damaged alveoli. And let's say here's the healthy alveoli in an ARDS patient. 
I'm gonna try to increase my tidal volume on these patients, right? Because that's the best way to increase ventilation. If I increase ventilation, I increase the actual uh, diffusion across the membrane, potentially increasing the oxygen. But if I do that, that air is not gonna go into this alveoli. It's gonna funnel into this alveoli. And so what happens is you're gonna have too much air going in here over distending the healthy lung tissue. What happens when you over distend healthy lung tissue? You damage it and you could potentially make the patient even worse. So that's why whenever we have patients with ARDS, we don't wanna to push tons and tons of volume onto them. We wanna do a low tidal volume method. Somewhere around four, if you really wanna know, four to six milliliters per kilogram of body weight. Okay, which is usually is like six to eight. Now that might lead you guys to ask a question. Well, Zach, if I'm not pushing a lot of air in, I'm also not gonna be getting a lot of air out, right? So if I'm not pushing a ton of air into the lungs because I lower my tidal volume, doesn't that technically mean that when I'm trying to exhale, I'm gonna exhale out less CO2? Yeah, it does mean that. What can that mean then if CO2 builds up in the blood? That could lead to potentially a increase in the protons, right? Carbonic acid. And that can do what to the pH? Drop the pH. This could lead to a respiratory acidosis, right? Well, what can we do whenever we decrease the tidal volume to protect the lung, but try to breathe off enough CO2 so we don't have that building up so much in the lungs? I'm sorry, into the bloodstream. What can we do? What if we increase the respiratory rate? If I increase the respiratory rate, I'm technically gonna breathe off more CO2. If I breathe off more CO2, what happens then? Remember Le Chatelier's principle from chemistry, right? It says that if you actually decrease that CO2, the reaction is gonna start shifting to the left. The pH is gonna start coming back up. You're gonna start getting a lot of rid of that CO2. So that's what we want. So technically, if we drop the tidal volume, we have to increase the respiratory rate, okay? Generally, that might mean you have to go a little bit higher than 20 breaths per minute on the patient. The next thing you gotta be careful of here is that, yeah, we're gonna be trying to ventilate the patient, but their alveoli are collapsed. How can I try to pop those alveoli open and keep them open when I'm exhaling? We can add in PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. This is the key when it comes to ARDS patients. They have so much fluid accumulating around these lungs that if I go ahead and also just so much surface tension, if I go ahead and introduce a little bit of pressure in here, after the patient exhales, I can keep those open a little bit and it's gonna be easier for the patient to breathe. So we might have to increase the PEEP a decent amount. What's a normal PEEP that we usually could use? Anywhere from zero to five. That's usually the normal PEEP that you would use. But for an ARDS patient, we might have to go higher. So sometimes they say greater than five centimeters of water for that PEEP, okay? Now, I told you that AC volume control isn't always the best with ARDS patients. What could we do that might be a little bit easier? We don't have to constantly make all these adjustments. Well, we can do volume control or we can do pressure control. So there is a bunch of different ways. And again, we're not gonna go into ton, a ton of detail here, but what I want you to know is with pressure control, that's one way that you can do this. There's another type of pressure control method called bi-level, okay? And then there's another one called APRV. Basically with these, you can set a particular time of inspiration. You can set a particular time of expiration. You can determine technically how much PEEP you want in the patient. Do you want them to have five? Do you want them to have 10 that they're inhaling? You can determine the amount of pressure that you're pushing into the patient, the inspiratory pressure. Do I want that where? Maybe 20 to 30 centimeters of water. And so this is really, really a, the more commonly utilized um, uh, ventilation method in patients who have ARDS. Uh, pressure control, there's a risk of asynchrony, okay? Bi-level, it's a little bit better because there's not as much asynchrony because with bi-level, again, they have the opportunity to have what's called spontaneous breathing and they get a little extra pressure support with that. APRV is also a commonly utilized one, but this one, they don't usually get extra pressure support during those spontaneous breaths above the, uh, the uh, positive inspiratory pressure, okay? What other things can we do to help this ventilation process? Well, obviously we want high PEEP, 
we would prefer more of the pressure bi-level APRV control methods. Sometimes you can use what's called inhaled prostacyclin. That's been shown to help a lot with these patients. Sometimes if you really need to, you can neuromuscular blockade them, especially when their ARDS is getting severe. You can give them paralytics. Another thing that you can also do here is besides the, in, the inhaled prostacyclin, besides the paralytics, is f there's shown that whenever you put a patient who is in severe ARDS into a prone position, it helps to kind of move the heart a little bit out of the way and helps their breathing process. So prone positioning is also a really big one here in these patients. So what if you try all of this? What if you try the mechanical ventilation processes and it's not working? The next thing you can try is you can try ECMO, okay? Which is the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation process. Really, you don't want the patient to have to go on that, but sometimes they might actually use ECMO if needed. So, basic concept I want you to remember here with the ARDS is here's the alveoli. They're collapsed, they have a lot of tension. What can I do that I want you guys to really remember if they have ARDS, which is a part of this mechanical ventilation? Remember to have high peak the positive end expiratory pressure. All right, that's what we want in these patients, to help to keep those alveoli open and to allow for better ventilation. If we have better ventilation, we're gonna to try to increase that PaO2. You know what's crazy though? Guess what we would prefer the PaO2 to maybe be in a patient with severe ARDS. We would be happy with greater than 55 millimeters of mercury. Preferably, you'd want that right in around the 100, right? You'd preferably you want 100. But if I get it greater than 55 in an ARDS patient, that's actually pretty good. All right, so we talked about treatment of patients with COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2, which can lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome, potentially SIRS, potentially septic shock, potentially multi-system organ failure. We talked about giving them fluids sparingly. We talked about Tylenol to reduce the fever. We talked about some of the medications that can be utilized. Again, they're particularly more the comfort measures, but they have been shown to be very effective and then particularly remdesivir is in stage three clinical trials. We talked about mechanically ventilating the patient, as well as if you're mechanically ventilating, you're breathing for them. So what also are you gonna need to be doing, unfortunately, to check to see where they're at? You might have to do ABGs to see where their PCO2 is, see where their PO2 uh, is as well, okay? And seeing if you need to change the settings. So now, what are things that we really want, we should talk about with this COVID-19? There are certain risk factors that put patients at a very severe, a higher rate of mortality, especially if they're a little bit older. Okay, we're gonna talk about that in the graph over here. But there's certain morbidities that put these patients at higher risk. What are some of those? One is cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is actually the highest risk factor, which uh, particularly the, high, the highest risk factor when it comes to morbidities that can increase mortality rate. So I want you guys to remember cardiovascular disease. What is the percentage? Their risk increases significantly by 10.6%. That's scary. That's not good. Okay. The other one is lung disease. So if they have some type of underlying pulmonary disease, if they have an underlying pulmonary disease, their risk increases by potentially 7.3%. So there is a 7.3% increase and their actual mortality, that's not good. Another one is diabetes. So if a patient has diabetes, whether it be diabetes mellitus type one or type two, whether it be insulin deficiency or insulin resistance, their risk increases by potentially 6.3%. That's, that's pretty bad. And the last one is if someone is immunosuppressed, they have cancer for some reason, right? Let's say that they're immunosuppressed or they have cancer, All right? We'll put cancer or they're immunosuppressed. And again, we also will talk about another risk factor, which is age. But cancer are immunosuppressed patients, their risk increases by 5.6%. So you can see now that the overall prognosis of someone who develops COVID-19, their, their mortality rate is gonna increase by 10.6% if they have an underlying cardiovascular disease, 7.3% if they have an underlying pulmonary disease, 6.3% if they have diabetes, and 5.6% if they're immunosuppressed, particularly if they have cancer.
What are some other things that increase the patient's mortality rate? Again, something that we don't want to have to see, but if we actually do blood work and we see specific inflammatory markers or uh, uh, markers of tissue damage, what are some of these things? If you see elevated D-dimer levels and elevated ferritin, this could be identifiable. Okay, so elevated D-dimers, which are the breakdown products of the actual, uh, whenever someone develops clots or there's widespread inflammation, this can also be elevated. Another one is if there is increase in ferritin, which is a protein that actually is going to be stored within cells and binds onto iron. The other one is if there are markers of tissue injury, particular cardiac tissue. If you see increased levels of CKMB, which is actually one of the markers for maybe cardiovascular, like a myocardial infarction, if that's elevated. And last but not least, if someone had L as elevated troponins, okay? So if there's elevated troponins, there's elevated CKMB, all of these inflammatory markers are markers of tissue damage have been associated with a higher mortality rate, okay? All right, so we talked about patients who have underlying risk factors, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, diabetes, cancer, or immunosuppressed, specific markers that we might find in blood work that also has been associated with a higher mortality rate. What else? Let's look at here at a graph, okay? So on here on the y-axis, you got mortality, and on the x-axis, you have age, okay? We can see by this bar graph where the highest mortality rate is. When we talk about less than 20, it's relatively low. So it's maybe actually like less than 1%. As we go 20 to 30, still relatively low. 30 to 40, pretty low. 40 to 50 starts increasing. 50 to 60, going a little bit up. And then look whenever we get greater than 60 all the way to greater than 80. We start seeing these actual mortality rates increasing. With the highest being in greater than 80 years old. Maybe around greater than 14%. So what do we know? The older the age, or particularly we can actually say greater than 60 years old is associated with a higher mortality rate. Now, a lot of people are trying to constantly say out there that, oh, this shows that younger individuals aren't really, you know, where they're not the population most affected by this virus. That's not necessarily true, okay? Just because the mortality rates are higher within these older individuals doesn't mean that you shouldn't respect the severity of this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It can infect younger populations. Although it's not as common and it is more common to affect and cause more critical illness within the older patients, we still need to be careful and be aware of how serious this virus potentially is, okay? All right, the last thing that we should talk about, guys, when it comes to COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus, is precautions, things that we need to take into consideration. Remember, remember that R0, right, that we talked about in the previous video. The R0 can range anywhere from two to three with COVID-19. Now, it potentially could be higher dependent upon those things we called super spreaders. Remember super spreaders, the people that might shed the virus a little bit more readily, or they're in a contact with a larger population size. So how can we reduce the R0? The most important thing that we can do is to self-quarantine, okay? By self-quarantining, you decrease your exposure to other infected individuals, okay? So we're not going to allow, that's gonna decrease that exponential growth. If you guys remember that, that chart, remember that graph? We drew this where we said, here's kind of our, our r naught here. We said that we see the, the COVID-19 is growing exponentially with an r naught greater than one, right? What we need to do is decrease exposure. So how can you decrease exposure? You self-quarantine, okay? And that's important as well as if you actually are developing symptoms and have COVID-19. The more we actually isolate, we quarantine, we decrease exposure, the more this r is gonna start to decrease. And we will see a lower, hopefully, a, ho a lower case number, as well as lower fatality rates, okay? So basically, isolation or self-quarantine. And again, this goes back to what I told you guys. If you notice you're developing symptoms, do not just go rushing into the emergency room. Why? Two reasons. 
One is there's a high chance of you spreading that virus to people also in the waiting room with you. Second reason, if you are not having the coronavirus, let's say, let's say that you don't have COVID-19 and you have the flu, well, you're technically now kind of immunosuppressed. So what does that mean? There's a higher risk of you getting infected with this now because you're immunosuppressed. And that could lead to some serious consequences. So if you develop symptoms, do not just go straight to the ER. Contact maybe your primary care physician, set up a telemed visit so that you're not going into their waiting room and potentially inoculating other people. Tell them your symptoms. They're most likely gonna tell you self-quarantine for 14 days, monitor your symptoms. If it gets worse, call me or contact the ER so that they can set up the necessary precautions and steps, okay? So very important. What else could we do? Wash your hands. Again, I told you that this can potentially be spread through fomites. What does that mean? Surfaces. So those respiratory droplets or fecal oral route, remember they can touch, stay on surfaces for potentially 24 hours. Wash your hands. Don't shake people's hands as well. Fist bump, give an elbow. But just do not be trying to shake people's hands and then potentially going and touching your face. So again, one big thing here is washing your hands. Doing it with soap and water using hand sanitizers, okay, as well. The next thing is if you potentially are touching surfaces, the best thing to do is not expose it to your mucous membranes. So let's say that you go and you touch a surface out where potentially there's been other people who maybe have been infected, they're touching like a, a doorknob or they're touching specific surfaces. You go touch that and then you touch the eyes. Potentially, even though it might be a low amount of inoculum, there's a potential for that virus to cause the infection. So do not touch the T-zone. So don't touch <laughs> your T-zone. So what does that consist of? The eyes, the nose, and the oral mucosa. Those are all sites for this to actually potentially cause infection. What else? Decreasing travel. Ninja Nerd Science Airlines, right? So we need to decrease travel, especially to areas where there is a high population of cases, okay? So decreasing travel is a big one. What else? Staying out of large crowds. Don't go around large crowds because there's a potential that you could actually catch the virus, okay? So again, washing your hands, don't touch your T-zone, decreasing travel, avoiding large crowds, staying greater than six feet away from people who maybe are showing symptoms, okay? Self-quarantining, isolating yourself so that we can drop that r naught. All right, last thing we need to be aware of is we wanna try to decrease, the, you might see in these graphs out there called flattening the curve. We wanna try to decrease the amount of patients in the hospital, that's the goal. Because the more patients we have in the hospital, the harder it's gonna be to control this, okay? So what are some particular precautions that you should be taking into consideration if you're working in a healthcare system? Masks, there's two different types of masks that we should talk about, okay? One of the masks is called the N95. So the basic thing that you should know about the N95 is this mask prevents things from getting in, okay? So if someone's around you, they're coughing, they're hacking, and those respiratory droplets spread, this mask, it tries to block 95% of the things trying to get through the mask, okay? So this is preventing things from getting in. Here, we'll put in, okay? The other one is the surgical mask. The surgical mask is basically protecting other people around you. So if you are actually coughing or sneezing, it's gonna stay into the mask. It's not gonna spread out potentially, and cause infection to other people. So this is something that if you are having symptoms, you could potentially wear these, okay? But again, this should be more for healthcare workers. It shouldn't be something that you're going and buying if you're gonna be at home. There's no need to do that, okay? The other thing is eye protection. That's a potential route for this actual virus to travel, right? So if you're in contact with a patient who potentially has the COVID-19, again, wearing eye protection. Uh, all your, your PPE basically, right? So wearing the proper gown, maybe gloving. Actually, there's been an, an intensivist who said that actually double gloving is actually gonna help as well. So double gloving, wearing your PPE, your gowns, making sure that you're wearing your eye protection. And if you are using masks, N95 to prevent things from coming in and the surgical mask to try to protect, protect other people from the things going out.
All right, engineers, so in this video, we talked about the treatment, we talked about the prognosis, and we talked about precautions that we should be taking with COVID-19 caused by SARS-CoV-2. I hope this video made sense. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, hit that like button. Matter of fact, smash that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, if you guys get a chance down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram, and even our Patreon account. If you guys get a chance to go there, we appreciate it. As always, engineers, love you and stay safe.